Hello, my name is Ricardo Castellini and this is the fourth video of our media literacy series. Last week I discussed why our data is so important for tech companies and how the digital media platforms operate. Today I'll start focusing more on the content that is produced and shared on the internet. As you know, this series emphasizes the critical aspect of media literacy. So when discussing content, I will focus on bad content, its production, its implications, and how we can avoid them. But what is bad content? Bad content is quite a generic term that may imply many different things. So it's important to explain what I mean and what I do not mean by bad content in this video. I'm certainly not talking about statics or creativity or production skills. Of course, there's a lot of bad content related to the elements I've just mentioned. But that's not my concern today. This kind of bad content might make you feel bored or uninterested, but they do not necessarily do you any harm. When I say bad content, I'm talking about content that can cause harm to people, companies, countries, institutions. Content that is treacherous, deceitful, dangerous. Content that can lead to uh, incorrect understanding and analysis, uh, dishonest behavior and wrong decisions. But what happens that all of a sudden we have so much bad content around? Well, the internet happened. There has always been bad content, but now it's much cheaper and easier to produce any kind of content and spread it around. Remember, anyone with a basic smartphone and a fair internet connection is a potential media producer. You are a potential media producer. Actually, every time you go online and share a post or comment on your friend's posts or share a, a, a video story on, on Instagram or Snapchat or TikTok, you are creating content. And there's another very important thing, the business model. Remember I introduced the business model of digital platforms in the previous video? Today I'm going to show you another interesting feature of this model, monetization. Again, the business model is not simplistic, so if you want to fully understand how it works, I recommend that you do a quick research and find more resources about that. There are plenty of videos on YouTube, for example, that explain at length how it works. Imagine you have a blog and you start getting a lot of followers. So you think, how can I monetize this? How can I make some money? One way is by registering your blog with the so-called ad network companies, such as Google AdSense which, by the way, is by far the biggest player in this market. Once you're registered, you earn the right to have a Google Display advertising on your blog, like this one here. Then, you can make money based on the number of people who view or interact with these ads. And the more followers you have, the more money you can make. Google AdSense has millions of affiliated websites. Your blog is just one of them. And advertisers don't necessarily know all the websites which their ads will be published on. These websites, including your blog, are ranked according to criteria that involve traffic, interactions, etc., which are mostly quantitative, not qualitative ones. So if the content of your blog is very poor, but you still have a lot of people accessing it, for Google, this is what matters. Quantity. You are a big player now. Even though Google requires all the websites to adhere to very strict rules uh, in relation to the content they provide, it's not possible to make sure that all the millions of websites are complying with these rules. So the problem is that anyone can create a website with harmful or deceitful content, register with Google or any other ads network company and start getting money with ads. And advertisers all over the world risk funding this kind of bad websites without even knowing they are doing that. Both governments and tech companies have been aware of this problem and some practices and policies are being developed to avoid this kind of uh, inappropriate funding scheme. But for now, it is still a big issue and has helped promote a lot of bad content around the world. And of course, there are other forms of monetization. For example, you can get an extra income based on the number of followers if you manage to create a successful profile on Instagram or TikTok. You can also create a YouTube channel and monetize it. So the more views your videos have, the more money you can make. But just like Google, YouTube cannot guarantee that 100% of the videos displayed on the platform 
have an appropriate content. So this model, on the one hand, is very good in a sense that it allows ordinary people like me and you to set up a website and, if we are successful, make some money out of it. On the other hand, any person in the world can produce harmful content and benefit from the same scheme. This model creates a situation whereby the number of clicks is more important than the quality of the content provided. It is quantity over quality. And unfortunately, many unreliable and poor quality websites know the tricks to attract people not by the quality of the content they provide, but by the way this content appeals to the audience. So how does this problem materialize in practice? In the previous videos, I discussed the importance of agreeing on an objective reality that is common to all of us based on facts, scientific evidences, and good quality information. I also discussed critical thinking and how it can help us understand the reality around us in a more uh, logical and analytical way. But we have to acknowledge that life is much more than rationality, logic, and scientific-based evidences. We can't measure everything, we can't explain everything, we can't prove everything. For this reason, our lives are filled with stories that go way beyond the objective reality. For thousands of years, we've been creating stories about everything. Why we are here, why this is good and this is bad, uh, what the best ideology to govern our country is, what the best formula to be happy is, uh, how the universe affects our lives, how I should behave in certain situations, etc. The combination of all these stories becomes the very fabric of our culture. Even though there are ideas that belong to the symbolic world and not real things, some of them are so well structured and connected to our realities that they become an intrinsic part of our lives. So they give rise to legal systems, uh, political institutions, economic ideologies, uh, educational theories, religious denominations, codes of practices, and so on. Other stories are regarded as not as relevant and sound as the ones I mentioned before, so they end up having a different status within our societies. But that doesn't mean they are not present in our minds and have relevance for many people. They certainly have a very interesting role in the way they provide people with meaning. Uh, superstition and mysticism are two examples of that. Other stories yet are regarded as inappropriate or wrong or dangerous. These are stories that, for example, try to proclaim that some humans are more evolutionarily developed than others, or deny historical facts to match their own ideological purposes, or refute uh, sensibleness and prudence to embrace obscurantism. And what do the internet and digital media have to do with that? Well, they provide uh, space, visibility, and a very lucrative business model for the production and spread of these stories. And some of these stories are dangerous ones, especially for vulnerable people, such as children, for example, or ill-educated and ill-informed adults. For example, the internet is filled with websites, blogs, uh, social media profiles, uh, YouTube channels that offer magic solutions for everything. And because the internet is still very poorly regulated, this market has thrived immensely over the past years. 5 steps to cure your depression 7 hidden secrets to make you rich in few weeks 3 simple stages to achieve the ultimate happiness There is a simple solution for everything. Some people are setting up websites, calling themselves experts or doctors, and offering miraculous solutions for every single problem on earth. They use digital marketing techniques to draw people's attention and persuade them to buy their products or services. During this pandemic, I came across a few pages where health professionals were saying that the virus is actually an illusion, that the best way of not getting sick is to think positive, drink some warm water with lime in the morning, rub some rosemary on your forehead, and connect your essence to the cosmos. And these people have thousands, sometimes millions of followers. Of course you can believe in whatever you want and people's beliefs must be respected. Likewise, I'm not suggesting that there is no space for mystical practices or alternative forms of health treatments. Of course there is, and there are plenty of good and honest practitioners and professionals out there. 
When it comes to sensitive topics such as health, people need to be sensible and held accountable for the ideas they are spreading. If you have many followers who trust what you're saying, you cannot simply sell anything without any consideration for how this can negatively affect people's lives. The combination of filter bubble, confirmation bias and the online business model creates the perfect scenario for some individuals to create the most bizarre, illogical and baseless stories, which can have very serious consequences for other people's lives. Take the example of conspiracy theories. A survey from 2018 found that in the United States, one in three young adults has at certain point in their lives believed that the world is not round. In England, a survey about conspiracy beliefs related to the coronavirus found that 50% of people showed some degree of belief in these stories. The anti-vaxxer movement has grown around the world and now a lot of people believe that vaccines, one of the most extraordinary accomplishments of science, cause autism or even worse, they come with a chip that will control your mind. And the list is endless. Uh, the New World Order, a secretive and authoritarian elite that intends to rule the world with a globalist agenda. QAnon, a story that claims that left-wing people in connection with Democrats and Hollywood actors are actually uh, Satan-worshipping pedophiles running a global child sex trafficking scheme uh, which is being confronted by um, Donald Trump. We know that conspiracies do exist. Governments conspire, powerful people conspire, organizations conspire. But the problem is when you lose touch with reality and begin to believe in anything that for some reason gives you some pleasure or comfort. These stories, bizarre as they are for most of us, find a special place in the minds of many people. But why? Well, first of all, if your knowledge repertoire has been undermined by the consumption of poor quality information, you have more chance to accept these stories as true. Second, remember our confirmation bias. If some story confirms our previous beliefs, no matter how strange it is, we have the desire and inclination to believe it is true. Researchers also suggest that we have the tendency to find patterns even when there is none which makes us see connections between ideas when actually there are no connections at all. The more a person needs to find patterns that provide predictability to their lives, the stronger is the tendency to see non-existing links between ideas, which favors the belief in conspiracy theories. As social animals, both status and validation are very important to us. And remember that social media platforms create a digital world especially tailored to us, where it seems that almost everyone agrees with our ideas. And studies show that the larger the amount of people believing in a story, the more likely it is we're going to accept this story as true. Conspiracy theories also make people feel special in some way. They think that only they and a few more people have access to a very privileged information or story. And whilst the rest of humanity is immersed in deception, they are the only ones who know the truth. And the structure of digital platforms only makes the situation worse. Social media algorithms help these bizarre stories to be recommended by its users, especially if you looked up information about similar stories in the past. The more you access these stories, the more the social media platforms will offer similar stories to you. And that's how you risk going deep down into the rabbit hole. And conspiratorial communities, they know that. So they take advantage of the structure of social media platforms in order to bring more people in. How can we avoid that? Remember critical thinking from the second video? That's a good way to start. And also loads of prudence and caution. Human beings are very good at creating stories, and some of them are actually very appealing. But we can't fall for anything without checking the evidences. In the next video, I will discuss how the news media can contribute to minimize the damage caused by bad producers and the toxic content that they create and spread around. See you guys there.